heck is on my You know, getting close to sundown, it started chilling. That was not good. And then last night, I got up this morning and had a doctor's appointment this morning at 9, and I had to sweep two or three inches of snow. Okay, good evening, everybody. It is 6 p.m. We'll go ahead and start the study session. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance, as I call the meeting to order, on Tuesday, November 8th at 6 p.m. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hoorah. Okay. Uh, are there any changes to the agenda? Anyone? Dr. Finch? No changes. All right, uh, communications? No communications for the study session. All right, then we'll jump right into the discussion item, options for remaining bond funds. So at this point, um, we, I guess we can open it up for any comments that anyone would like to make. And if you would, uh, I see we have a microphone here, so I would ask that you step up to the mic and make your comments so everyone can hear you well. Don Kirby. Uh, earlier today, I sent an email out to Dr. Finch. I'm not certain whether you distributed that to the rest of the board or not, or your dialogue with uh, the business manager. But uh, I wanted to follow up on um, the comments uh, that were made uh, during the community forum meeting on October 18th, wherein the discussion on ESSER funds was. Um, discussed and the applicability and um, what those funds could or could not be used for. Uh, when we had um, inquired of that, um, the, the uh, reply that uh, came back was they're very restrictive uh, in nature. Um, they're not able to be used uh, for uh, efficiency upgrades, uh, rather it's, it is it uh, is mostly for um, circulation and that sort of um, uh, protocol, if you will. Um, and so uh, I, uh, I took that and I, uh, I ran with that and decided to do some research. As you, I don't know, many of you know, we're in the business, we deal with a lot of school districts we help school districts along with uh, seeking funding for grants and projects. And um, anyhow, long and short, short of it, um, I reached out to the business managers and the facility maintenance directors from six school districts, talked with each one of them. That included Toppenish, Sunnyside, Zilla, Mount Adams, Granger, and, and most recently Sela today. 
and I had uh, I had asked them what their protocol was and how they were getting funding through the ESSER grant program, and very simply indicated basically that the application is the application you apply for it, and uh, there has never been any type of a uh, denial. Um, to that end, uh, the projects that uh, uh, we discussed, I discussed with the, uh, the, 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 the districts, for instance, Toppenish School District, uh, ESSER funds are being used to do their uh, preschool facility. The, uh, the, uh, the grant application, uh, basically the basis for that was to increase social distancing, reduce classroom, uh, size, improve indoor air quality, and uh, also HVAC. We're also doing a multi-purpose facility with them at the high school under the ESSER grant program as well. With regard to Granger, Granger School District, Granger is doing a track modernization project. The uh, description with regard to that using the ESSER is the existing cinder track needs, to, uh, needs modernization to promote increased social distancing, reduce classroom size, improve fresh air opportunities, and better segregate. That's, that's under the ESSER, track improvements. Sunnyside, two projects going on. One Chief Kamayakin HVAC replacement, three and a half million dollars, full HVAC replacement for the DOAS systems. And then at H, uh, Harrison, the same way, 2.5 million. Zilla, um, 2.2 million HVAC upgrades. They're currently in design. They haven't gone out to bid yet. Talk with the superintendent this afternoon on that. SELA School District, SELA Intermediate School, 364,000. I went a step further. I talked with um, Apollo Mechanical Solutions, who I understand has been in concert, uh, in, uh, in, in discussions with you and Joe, said that, uh, indicated that uh, they were able to uh, provide a proposal, show some funding for the ESSER systems long ago. I understand that there was an email that was sent by uh, Mike Fuentes of Apollo Mechanical as well to that uh, particular element. Um, and so uh, I guess that was an email of October 20th that uh, Apollo had reached out. And then finally, and lastly, more importantly, I spoke with OSPI. And I spoke with Amy Harris, who, as you uh, may or may not know, is a director of federal fiscal policy and grants management. She is the individual who's in charge of the ESSER fund dis distribution. She sent me an email um, back, and um, I apologize, Dr. Finch, for not getting it to you sooner. Uh, this was dated October 20th, uh, but uh, basically the, 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 the crux of it is she's never denied any type of ESSER application as it applies to HVAC, indoor air quality, uh, door and window um, replacement, carpeting issues, any of those items that basically I, we saw on the capital projects list that was distributed on the 18th of uh, October. So I would encourage you to uh, take a look at that and um, I guess reevaluate the position of the district wherein ESSER funds could be used. And um, I would have let it go, um, but um, with regard, if you would have just said, hey, we're using the ESSER funds for you know, curriculum and you know, everything else. But it was clear to me in that meeting that there might be a misinterpretation or you're being fed some, you know, information that wasn't necessarily, you know, compliant or true from other sources. And I'm here to tell you that affirmatively, uh, I believe that you can use these funds. Okay. I appreciate that information. We just want to remind that uh, not only is there a vetting process with the OSPI, but there's also the auditing process for the use of the federal funds. So that is also a consideration. All right, thank you. Um, are there any more comments? Would anyone else like to comment?
Wilson? <laughs> um, I'll reiterate what I stated at the last meeting a little bit, and then I'll just shut it down. Um, I've had eight kids through this school district. Um, I have 17 grandchildren, another one on the way. Maybe some more, who knows. <laughs> but the district has done a marvelous job over the years in all areas that I can see, other than the anomalies that happen in any kind of operation or business. And uh, my view is this, because I was on the bond issue for the high school. And believe me, it was a, a major, major undertaking, taking hundreds of hours from multiple people on that committee. And it failed a couple of times. And we went back to the public to find out where the strong points and the weak points were in the voters' minds. And it caused <coughs> me to run that thing, but at least we found some information out. In purging a lot of stuff that I've had in my files for a long time, I ran across some of that data and, and, and the, the, the outtakes that we discussed. And I think that would be pertinent information to include in some of your decision making to throw it up and say, is this going to stick or does this make sense or does this parallel uh, current issues today we face? And I'll be more than happy to give that to whoever's interested in it. The other thing is, you know, it's tough enough to run a bond or a levy. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how you analyze it or who's in the room trying to figure out what should we do next? How should we advertise it? How should we communicate with the public? It's a no-win situation, one way or the other. People who vote no win. People who vote yes uh, lose. So um, in some cases when it fails. The opposite occurs, obviously, if the tables are turned. I think that, you know, you've got however it, it accrued, but you've got $19 million in the bank. And these people that are serving this community here were, were voted to take their time and give their best account for what decisions that are to, to be made or have been made. And some have been here and served a long time. I think that we ought to trust their judgment. I think the $19 million, it, it's a no-win either way. If you give the money back, try to run a bond for whatever you're asking for, uh, for your needs you have a very difficult time getting that stuff passed. It's very costly and it's frustrating. And with the economic condition we have now, it's gonna be a hard road ahead, I think. So I'm in favor of personally giving the board the responsibility to decide how that money is to be used when it comes down to this state rule and this federal rule. And I don't know who controls what part of, of that money, but if it's the feds, it's a different deal. If it's the state, look at your, all, all of your senators and representatives and the majority spends the money any damn way they want to. So whatever the rules are, they, they never go by. I've seen it happen in my time over and over and over. So, you know, they control the school funding, city funding, parks, the whole ball of wax, Sun Dome that was built. It's an interesting story to figure out how that got built, but it, it wasn't a very it wasn't a very simplified process. It was over a couple beers, and that was the end of it. So it's all arm wrestling and verbal BS, and uh, we deserve better than that. But that's what we get. So nothing we can do about it. But I favor letting the board decide what they want to do if they want the information that I have from my previous experience as a, one of the people who were uh, helping get the school built here at the high school. 
I'll be more than happy to turn that over and let them board through it. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comment. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> there was some information. <laughs> there was some information regarding voting and what that cost was. I know that there's multiple numbers out there. I think it was 30,000, 60,000, 100,000. I think there's a whole bunch of different numbers. Just I want to provide clarity what that cost is for the general elections. It's around 28 to 30,000 dollars. And then there's miscellaneous costs that come along afterwards that could be anywhere from 17 to additional $30,000. So one voting could be up to $60,000. So I just want to make sure I provide that clarity because I heard multiple numbers during the forum. All right. Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Board members? Anyone? Hmm. All right, thank uh, each and every one of you who did uh, give us comments. We appreciate that and hopefully we'll hear more as time moves on. Uh, items arising. Oh, wait. Well, uh, there's discussion oh. items now. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I miss something? Well, it's an opportunity for the board to discuss what the oh. next steps are. Thank you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> board members, discussion. Before I forget, <clears throat> Scott. That information you talked about that would help us, is it all written out? It should, I think I've got two or three forwards that were random notes, exit thoughts based on what we discussed, and, uh, and uh, stuff from the auditor that showed where the votes came from, plus and minus in the different uh, voting districts. And I'm assuming they just do that. For everybody, I mean, it's free. So uh, it was, I didn't realize they had that until I started digging into it. But we had to know where the push points were, where the, where the pressure points were. Mm -hmm. And we didn't know that. We were all new, you know, at it. And we were all new, and we were all new, and we were all new, and we to learn as we go. So, but, uh, you know, I can condense it, and the stuff is perfect, and we uh, Give that to you and let's go through it. And at least maybe there may be a few things that would perk interest or fit into today's decisions. Okay. Could you please do that? Sure. Give it to Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Anyone else on the board? You know, one of the things that we could, if we're not getting too far ahead, is just start discussing what next steps would be would be like. What what do they look like to each of you, or what are you thinking at this point in time? If anyone wants to jump in, for me, the next step is to get hard information. I'm really kind of frustrated because we 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 hear this amount and this amount. It's like Joe, you're talking about how much it costs for the run a boat. And uh, I would like, I would like to know as close as we can the cost of a track and football field, and minor repairs, uh, railing up the middle of the walkway so old people like me don't trip all the time going up there. Uh, I'd like to know more about. You have somebody doing the roofing estimate right now. Uh, I'd like to know, and this one just kind of frustrates me because it was the number two area in the long range plan, if I'm right, Greg, or was the uh, auditorium. Ryan, it was the auditorium, correct? I mean, it was the two buildings, and then the next one was auditorium, and I don't know what needs to be done with the auditorium. And I'd love to know, there must be certain priorities. So one was handicapped access but uh, priorities of what we need to do with that. Uh, then I would like to know immediately, immediate needs, like I think a broken water line or a dirty water line at the high school was one of the things that was on that list, some kind of a water line at the high school. Uh, I've got it here somewhere. Uh, but things that have to be done right away or must need to be done right away 
So we can look at a list and if we are gonna do anything, make a decision on priority one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, and I want, it's hard to not understand some of this is estimates and sometimes you have to pay people to make an estimate. But right now we're bouncing figures on a football field and track between two and a half million and seven and a half million. And we can't do that. We, we have to have a better figure and a better idea. Uh, on the football field, we're talking about a all turf or artificial turf. We need to talk about that. Uh, auditorium, uh, Richard's not here yet, but uh, Richard was, we were waiting for Richard to get to, into his job and get comfortable as the middle level principal. Then he was gonna give us a better feel for what needed to be done at the auditorium. And he's been in the job for two years. So I think he should have an idea by now of what basically needs to get done. Just information, but I want it to be hard information. I don't want it to have a different number each time we come to the meeting. So that we really do need to know, we do know what we're talking about. That's mine. Anyone else? I have a different idea. I think we need to immediately move forward with having the public hearings and get this for a vote of the school board as soon as possible. And the, and the, and the public hearings can incorporate the, uh, the numbers that, that Mr. Jager's talking about, but it really needs, I, I think we need to make a decision about, are we gonna defease the money back? Are we gonna keep it? Are we gonna do half and half? We need, to, we, we need to do the things, we need to make a decision. Um, we've, we've known for quite some time that we would be in this position. Um, I don't believe that the school board um, members will uh, be in consensus and that's okay, but I think that I think we need to make a decision about philosophically, are we, what, what are we gonna do? And um, I feel very strongly about what I think we ought to do, but I think we need to have a vote about that. And we need to go through the process to, to, to make that decision. And yes, I, I've said it, I'll say it again, we have, we have maintenance needs in the district. There are things that we need to do. I think the question really is, is how are we gonna go about paying for that? And that's where I think the philosophical difference lies, is how are we gonna go about paying for that? Um, I just feel that, and I'm sorry to repeat myself on this, but, but I'm gonna say it again. I just feel that this bond was for a very, specific purpose. And yes, I'm very aware of the wording that was used and it does and that the law allows us to go through the public hearing process and potentially redirect that money for other purposes. But we ran the bond very intentionally for a specific purpose. There's no denying that. And the history of this district, Mr. Wilson alluded to it, it's very difficult to pass bonds and levies. It's very difficult to get the high school done. There were decisions made after that bond was passed that have come back to haunt us into the future of passing this bond. We know what that history tells us and we ran this bond on a simple promise and we are just about over the finish line and, and, and I worry, I wanna play the long game with this decision, I really do. But we need to make a decision and it's as difficult as it is, um, we need to make a decision. If we decide to spend this money, I have every confidence that our school district will be wise with that money. But the problem is, is that again, how will that be seen? That is a very risky decision. Yes, there's risk and everything's gonna be more expensive and 
we have these needs and it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's supposed to be. But we just need to make a decision and, and, and that, that's our next step is we need to schedule these public hearings, go through that process, and then somebody's going to make a motion and it's likely going to end up in a three to two vote. And if, and that's, and, and that's, that's this system. That's where we find ourselves. Um, I'd just like us to think about the decision in terms of playing the long game. Thank you, Mr. Thorner. Um, anyone else? Um, Mr. Meyer or Mr. Mokel? Yeah, I've thought about it a lot, obviously. Like the other board members, I'm sure. Looked at a lot of different things and talked to a good number of our constituents out in the district. And, you know, looking back at what we've done over the last nine, ten years of, of uh, taking you know, a million dollars and putting it into capital funds every year from the general fund, and we're falling behind. We can't keep up with the needs. And when it looks, you know, I'd like to be pretty pragmatic about it in that we've got money available at this point in time with the right prioritization of the projects that need to be done. I'm sure, you know, this board and, and has been very prudent and frugal when it comes to expenditures on different things. And I also look at the economy and what's going on today and how hard it is for each individual out in our community, <coughs> a lot of them, to make ends meet. And I know I sit on another financial institution board and liquidity for those folks is becoming a real problem. So that means the money that you're going to loan, and I'm going to run on with this about our community, becomes the lending agency for us in a bond issue. And like Mr. Wilson said, you know, bonds have always been tough to pass. It's going to be a lot harder. And if we don't use these funds at this point, don't decide to do that, and we don't know yet on how that vote's going to go, but we're just going to get farther behind. And if we gave it all back, you know, we defused it all. Then we're out the opportunity that we have in front of us to maybe get caught up on the majority of these capital projects. And we go for a bond or a, a levy and try to pass it. It's going to be really, really difficult regardless. So I think we will have at this point missed a unique opportunity. And I understand, you know, fully what Mr. Thorner was saying and that explicit for two things, but I don't see it that way. I see it was explicit for one thing, and that was the better educational facilities and opportunities for our students. And that's why I think that the funds that we have used properly will continue that sales pitch, if you will. So leaving it at that, you know, I have, like I say, I talked to a lot of folks and when it comes to on well, the football field and the track and all that, there's all kinds of ideas out there. Some of them really good. You know, we got a beautiful soccer facility and I was down at Grandview here last week, week, I don't know. My granddaughter was playing down there for a birth to state in soccer and They've got an absolutely, I haven't checked into it to see what it cost them, but they've got an absolutely beautiful facility. It's better than a lot of colleges that I've been to with the track, you know, and the turf field that both soccer and football share. They don't practice on it, but they play their games on it. <laughs> and, you know, what? but if we did something like that, my question was, what the heck do we do with that soccer facility we've got down at the old high school? Because it's nice. It really is. And that could become a practice field, I guess, for both soccer and football. Then you got to figure out who gets to use it at what time, you know, so we don't keep our kids out till 10 at night <laughs> kind of thing. It's nothing simple. There's always another alternative or something, but 
what I'm saying, and, and it was explained really well to me how consolidating those would can save a lot of money as far as those two sports go, and three, track. So another thing to look at, but I don't know the numbers because I didn't go down there and, and talk to anybody about what they spend on that facility, but those uh, agricultural folks down there coughed up quite a bit, I'm afraid, just from the look of it. That's it. All right, thank you, Mr. Meyer. Mr. Moko, would you like to, or <laughs> you can? You don't have to. I don't want no, to I, I think that I think that the people want to hear where we're coming from, and this is an opportunity for them to hear us. Um, I've listened to. I was not involved except for being in. Uh, I don't even remember. Was it a guardian angel where we were making phone calls? Um, on, on levies and the bonds in the past. Um, but I've listened to um, and I've taken to heart words that have come from Ryan Matthews and Michael Moore who worked um, tirelessly and very close and um, know that bond um, probably better than any two people in our community. Um, and each one of them had said that that bond was run specifically for two schools. Um, they both have shared their opinion um, um, in our public forums to defease that money back. If we were to not defease that money back, it would be a huge slap in the face, I believe, of those two gentlemen that worked tirelessly on that bond in any future fundraising opportunities that we would be looking for in our district, we wouldn't be able to recruit those two men to help us as they have in the past. Um, there's another word besides specific that runs through my mind and, and that is transparency. Um, I have heard um, from many of our community members uh, through the community forums, through emails, through face-to-face -face conversations um, about how do we remain transparent? And I think that, um, my personal opinion, I think that by defeasing that money, we are transparent in what we, uh, um, what our, what our intentions are. Um, I am in 100% agreement that, um, everything on that, the, the capital projects list, um, some of them may be a want, but most of them are needs. Um, but I have, I have a list of 15, 16, 20 uh, different um, ideas that have come across either my email um, or people have, have talked to me about, and that number, the, the list keeps growing. Um, additional coaches, uh, water fountains in different schools. At some point, that 19 million is gonna dry up and somebody's uh, somebody's wish list is not going to be attended to. Um, so I think if we are looking to raise funds for those, uh, for those items, um, especially the big ticket items, um, we need to be transparent on how we're going to uh, raise the money for that in a bond or for running a capital levy. Um, um, I guess in my mind that the, the, the bond asked the community for the funds to build two schools and, and we've, we've done that. Um, I would be um, in favor of holding um, some of the bond proceeds back for each of those schools um, for um, any situations that arise at those two schools, but any other projects um, I, you're right, Mr. Meyer, that the facility at Grandview is, uh, is a dream. Um, uh, I, I talked to Michael Moore about the Sunnyside's, um, facility and it sounds like it's a dream. Hermiston High School, it sounds like it's a dream. Um, I'm a football guy. I coached football for 30 years. Um, there is not, uh, in my mind, I don't think that um, there is another way to highlight your district than having a uh, Friday night with the lights on and the band and the cheerleaders and a great football game and the barbecue going on. 
um, at a quality stadium. And we, after I uh, was able to, at homecoming, be able to sit on the radio again with Michael Moore and look at the condition of the track and the field, it does need to, it does need work. And it, um, short of calling it an eyesore, um, it, it's not a great facility. Um, yes, we need to have, uh, we need to have a, a darling like that. Mr. Jagger is right that that auditorium at the middle school is a gem. It needs to be fixed. It needs to be updated. It needs to be um, brought to compliance for ADA purposes. Um, but to do it in this fashion, um, I, I believe that those items were on bonds in the past that have failed and when they were taken off a bond passed. And I, I believe it's a little bit underhanded and a little bit under mining, I guess, to, um, to now have a, a bond um, where we have some oversight dollars that we're going to fund those things in that way. So uh, my mind has is, is really changed. I was torn when we started um, talking about this, uh, the $19 million, and, and if we were going to defeat it or not. Um, but as time has, has gone on, I just think that um, the two words, transparency and specific, have, have come to the front of my mind. And we need to be specific on how we're going to raise the monies for those and be transparent on what we are going to raise money for. Um, so I guess that's kind of where I'm at. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moko. And I guess that leaves me for last here. So I was just writing some notes down as I listened to the various comments. And again, as I've said in a previous meeting, thanks to each of the board members and colleagues I, I deal with all the time on these various issues for being so passionate about their beliefs and their thoughts. I do feel that every one of us has the best interests of the, the West Valley School District in heart, at heart. And makes the decision based on what they feel personally is best for the school district. It's not a political one. It's not a personal bias. It's what they truly feel. And I, I really appreciate and respect them all for that. My thoughts. Um, you know, I, I listened to um, a good friend here, Mr. Thorner. I kind of disagree with him here. I, I don't want to rush to a decision on this. I think we need to take our time and get it right the first time because once those funds, a decision is made, it's done and we need to make sure we get it right. What's most important to me, and I've said this many a time, is that we have community input and the full support of the community as much as we can get. We don't have a good sense of where the community lies. Right now, my sense, to be honest, is a little bit leaning toward using the funds. I've talked to a lot of different people. I had somebody meet me today or catch me in at Starbucks, recognize me, stop and talk to me. Instead, they just, in honesty, he, he was uh, uh, giving a compliment to all of us. He respects the way we're handling this and being as transparent and open as possible about this. But I do think that we need to make sure we're getting as many pieces of input from our community members before we make a decision. I don't want to go and just say we're going to go forward and bull forward here or push our way forward without making sure we've made every effort to hear from as many people as possible. What I would like to see us do is put together, there were a number of items on that maintenance list that did not have prices associated with them because we really couldn't figure them out or the prices change so frequently that it's hard to get a fix on them. I think we need to pick a point in time, come up with some numbers, go back, do a last forum for the community with final input, and then do the hearings is my, my, my preference at this point. Again, trying to get as much community input as we can. Um, also, you know, just in hearing both sides, you know, whether we keep the funds or defeat them back. I, you know, I don't feel that this is a loss for the community. I, I worry that it's an all or nothing game. You know, I don't want to see us polarized to the point that, well, if you disagree on this side and you do it the other way, we've betrayed another side of the community. I don't feel that way at all. We're being as open and public as possible. They have a perception, they have a point of view, and I respect it immensely. That doesn't mean I have to agree with it just to give them that respect or to get their respect. I would hope that they would respect me on the basis of knowing that I have the best interests of the school district at heart. 
Um, also, another factor that I think has to weigh into this, we have to be realistic in terms of what would happen if we did another vote. Uh, I heard someone say, it's going to be difficult to pass another bond or levy regardless. Whether or not we defeat or give the money back, that is not, in my mind, a convincing argument because the climate is what judges is, is going to make that judgment for us. I strongly believe, if I, I hate even going back to some of the prior stuff, but I firmly believe the reason that the bond failed with the first two, the two schools and the, the mid-level campus is the price tag was simply too high. A hundred plus million dollars, the community wasn't ready to swallow that. And we would be fooling ourselves not to take a good hard look and really think about that. We lowered the cost, we went back and the bond passed. Not by a lot, but it did. But that is a key factor also in my mind is in another part of the consideration. So I think in the end, Mr. Meyer had a great comment here. It, it, it's Sorry a tremendous. Tony or Kevin, could you report to Jim? Tony or Kevin, we have your main Jim, please. Thank you. Uh, Tony or Kevin, could you report to Jim? What we have in front of us is a tremendous opportunity. It is. It's probably a once in a generation lifetime to come up with this kind of money and figure out what to do with it. But we need to be prudent. We need to be smart and not tie ourselves to any one perspective. We have to realize in the end, the community, the school district, and our kids and our students are the ones who are going to benefit from this no matter what we do. I don't wanna see us saying that, well, I'm mad and you know what, I'm not gonna support you guys the next time around. That's no good. We're here for, everybody here in this room is here for a reason because they believe in what's going on in this school district and they wanna figure out how to best help and provide their input. That's what I value the most. Doesn't mean we're all going to agree, but we need to come up with the best decision. So in the end, I say, don't rush it. Let's do another forum. Let's get some hard numbers, prioritize things on what we would do. Tell the community what we would do if this is what we did, or if we decided to defease the money, then we go into it with our eyes wide open in terms of, we looked at this from all angles. We looked at it as hard as we could. This is what we ultimately decided. And if it were a decision to defeat the money, it, in my mind, it wasn't because this is what we, the only thing we voted for. It was because I feel it's the best thing for the school district. So I, I just want to make that point clear. And that's it. That's all I have to really say about it. I think it's an approach that we need to, to weigh out carefully, and I don't want to see us just rush just for the sake of doing it. We're not rushing just for the sake of doing it. We've known about this for two years, Mark. We have known about it for two and, years. And we should have made the decision two years ago about what we would have done, not, oh my gosh, we have $19 million and so let's spend it. That's not my point. My point is we would be doing this now without the input of the community. And yes, two years ago, we knew, we knew about what it was two years ago, but we didn't know how much money we were going to have, right? We, there's a lot of things we can say we know. There's a, every argument you make, I can make the counter argument. So we had 8,612 people vote in the 2019 bond. 5,239 voted yes, 3,373 voted no. It narrowly passed, as you just mentioned. The next election that we had was the 22 levy, okay? We went from 60, just a shade over 60% passage on the bond to a year ago, just a few months ago. 8,200 people, nearly the same, within 400 people voted in the levy as they did in the bond. In 22, earlier this year, 4,309 people voted yes, 3,941 voted no. You can talk about all the reasons why that might be, but we are losing ground. And it's maybe not specifically the West Valley School District, but... That's a significant, I mean, if we, if, 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 if we would be passing bonds and levies at a 60 to 70% clip every single time that we were putting out the vote, I probably would feel different about philosophically what we should do. We just, we just aren't there and we're not even close to there. And so again, I, it's, to me, philosophically, again, it's all about risk and what, what you know, again, we're going to, again, if we spend this money, yes, we're going to do a great job. 
we would do a great job. I'm, I'm, I'm totally confident we would do a great job with this money. I think there's another idea out there that we haven't even talked about that is a it's capital maintenance, capital projects list. We can almost build for the same money plus state match. You could almost within a few million dollars build a brand new elementary school with this money that we have. We haven't even talked about that idea. So we raise money for two schools and we only, and we're gonna get three out of it. That would be tremendous. But or you add on to White Hollow or some of the other schools. You that just could... We've got a prototypical school yeah. that's ready to go out at a tandem. We just build the same thing at we just build the same thing that we just built. And we know what that cost would be. Yeah. And and so we have $19 million plus eight in match. We're, we're, we're that close. But but going back to the going back to the maintenance needs for a second, we have been, as Mr. Meyer pointed out, we have been we have been falling behind. Why do we fall behind? Because some of the what we had to spend money on was because we failed Apple Valley and some of you replacing those for capacity, and so we had to use capital projects monies to buy and refurbish and site portables. So that's part of the reason why we've gotten behind. The other thing is, is that we need to just do a, frankly, a better job budgeting our maintenance needs. And some of this stuff that is, is, is tagged as high, I know we're going to do this year. So if, if a new soccer football slash track facility is something that this district wants to do, and it's really hard to, and it's really hard to make an ask for that, then why don't we, why don't we do like anybody else would do why don't we start setting some money aside to try to to try to fund that project and say this is what we're gonna do um i don't know i i i i, I don't want to rush the decision either but i don't feel like we've been rushing the decision more community forums is not going to, I mean, it's, it's, it's not that that's a waste of time though. I was, I, I was, I was praying that somebody would come forward with somebody, something that I hadn't thought of just yet. And that hasn't happened. <coughs> what happened is, is that, the, that what, what we got was, is, is we got a lot of the same thing that all of the board, and that's actually good too, that we're kind of confirmed on the, well, all five of us are on the right track because mm -hmm. the, what we heard at the community forums was a lot of what we have said. And then what concerns me is, is that some of what we heard of what we need to use this money on was a very emotional decision. This bond was not, this bond was passed with the idea of a plan in mind. And we're going to get off that plan if we're going to get off that plan and the entire long range facilities plan, that whole thing and how we're going to go about replacing the Tana, replacing Mountain View, replacing the junior high, all of those things that we need to do, those will all go by the wayside if we don't do the right thing here. So... I, that's where I, I shouldn't say that will happen. That's what I worry will happen. I think mm -hmm. the risk is too great. So okay. I don't know. Well, I just, I just don't know. Okay. Can I, can I say something? Sure. I, I, I'm after you. Go ahead, okay. Mr. Mr. Jager. I got five points. One options. At the last meeting, Mike Thorny talked about running a, a capital levy. Not next year, but the year after, I guess. Correct. For like nine million dollars. Yep. At forty-five cents a thousand. Right. Okay. I would like Joe to make sure that those numbers are right, because I I don't I kind of in a way question that. <laughs> Secondly, I don't think football field track is on that list. Correct. At the nine million. Right. That's correct. Okay, so you're not talking about football track with that at all. Well, I I I I don't think I have a list. I, I think that my idea, but let me, let me be specific. If we were to run a capital levy for eight or $9 million, we need to have a defined list. I'm, I'm not, I, I shouldn't say that it's not on there. Um, I shouldn't say that it's not on there. I think we just need to put a defined list together 
where we could raise eight or $9 million. And please, by all means, check my math. All I did to run that, Dave, was I emailed the assessor. I asked them for what the total assessed value um, was for 2023 in the district. He gave me that number and I, and I put it into a spreadsheet. In, <laughs> it very well could be wrong, but, uh, you know, so don't check, don't, don't, uh, don't uh, rely on the lawyer's math. But back to your point, Dave, on point number two, no, I, I, did, I don't have a specific, I don't think it's going to, $7.8 million. I mean, I don't know if that that is or isn't. I mean, certainly in my mind, a have to is replacing the track. Um, uh, and then, and so a have to is replacing the track. And another, I think have to is, is making um, seat improvements at the, at the, at the football stadium so that we have rails and so forth. And that's certainly not $7.8 million. So, but, but the idea behind the capital lev capital levy would be to run a defined list with hard numbers. Okay. I just, I, I, I want to get hard information. And from my look at that $9 million, it didn't include a track in a football field. Uh, secondly, I, we're saying the same thing in that we want to get hard numbers and then make a decision. What we're arguing about is how fast it takes, how long it takes to get hard numbers. I do not want to have any final meetings and make a vote until we have had all the information we need compiled and brought to us. And that means not rushing it. And I don't want Joe to try to rush it and get some wrong numbers. We need the correct numbers. Uh, Mike brought up a good point, football, track, soccer field. Right now, I'm not sure if that's feasible. I'm not sure if we have enough room to do all those in that space. And we're not gonna move our bleachers, I don't believe. So we have to check on that too. Having a track football field, this turf would be wonderful if we could have it. I've, I've seen the statements from soccer parents saying, why do we sit on these benches when they have a football field with bleachers and stuff? And I mean, it, they're kind of second class citizens. So I, I like the idea of doing all three, but I'm not sure we can. And again, that's information we need to gather. If you sit at Eisenhower on their football track, it is much wider than ours. There's much more space between the bleachers. Why? Because there's, and I think lanes are supposed to all be the same width, but they must have more lanes. So we need to talk about that. How many lanes should a track have? There's a lot of work to be put in to before we finally decide what a football track, maybe soccer field is gonna cost. Uh, transparency. <laughs> I think all this started when White Hollow was built, and I came into White Hollow about three years after it was built, and they were still upset there. White Hollow had the opportunity to add a wing at, at the, in this building stage, and the district said no. And so they did not build a wing, a last wing, in White Hollow. Instead, they fixed the facade. They fixed the front of the high school. We, we fixed the front of the high school. Uh, when White Hollow opened, it was full. And the group at White Hollow was not a bunch of happy campers, guaranteed, because they knew they had the chance for that to be a bigger building, and the district overruled and built something at the high school. That irritated a lot of people. The problem is with that, their thinking was, you only have that option of adding an extra wing, I think, at the very beginning of construction. We added an extra wing at the high school or extra rooms at the high school. We added extra rooms at both elementary schools, but that decision was made way early. It's not something you can make the last two months of the project. So uh, I kind of understand why we kind of blew it at White Hollow. They didn't make the decision. They couldn't make the decision early. And by the time they had, it, uh, had a chance to make it, it was too late, but we did blow it. And I think that's the main reason a lot of people are upset is our decision at, at Whitehall in the high school. Uh, but transparency, we've had two meetings. We've had board meetings. Great article in the paper. Uh, well, actually, two articles in the paper. Wonderful. I think as far as being transparent, and they're good articles, and they're not biased in any way, uh, we are being transparent. Uh, finally, Mike, we needed to wait. We may have known 
two years ago about this money, not this, we didn't know 19 million guaranteed, but we knew we had some money left over two years ago. You can't do anything until the project's over and you really just listen to the White Hollow and uh, or no, some of you in Apple Valley staff, don't you dare spend any of that money for a year because if we need it, we get it first. We heard that at almost every board meeting. And so that we had to wait a year. We couldn't do anything ahead of time. Philosophically, we could have answered the question that we were going to just, we were going to finish these schools. We're going to get Apple Valley and some of you done and to fees the money. We could have made that decision two years ago. Well, we could have, we could have made that decision. Yeah. That uh, was the decision that I asked to be made two years ago when we knew we were where we would end up when we got the, when we got the favorable bids in. The and, GCCM project. And Mike, I think there's a reason why we didn't make that decision two years ago is because some of us on the board didn't agree with that. Correct. That's fine. Well, and that's, now, and that's now why we didn't make the decision. And now we're going to make a huge mistake, but that's okay. I mean, that's your that's, opinion. That's, that's your my opinion. opinion. That's yeah. right. And that's why, again, we're, we're not going it, to, it's, this is not going to be a five to zero vote. So it's just not. I'd love to compromise. I've tried to throw out some. I've tried to throw out some reasonable ideas. We want to get the community input. We really want to get the community input. We defeat the money back and run a run a levy for a defined list that the people know exactly what 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 we intend to do with that money. In response to a, for a lot of people in the district will be, why did you give us all this money back and then in a year and a half ask for it? Because it's the honest and right thing to do. <laughs> I think it's hard for some people to understand that logic. Well, you have the money. I, I trust the community that they that they will understand. Well, we have I, a very think, intelligent community that I believe in that they that if we communicate our needs properly, uh, that 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 they will support us just as they have in the past. See, and I, I have not been hearing that. I've been hearing the same thing Mark's been hearing. Why give it back if you need it? Use it. Use it right now. Get it done with. And in two years, you've increased inflation, what, 20%? I've heard from, um, from people say the same thing. I'm prepared. I've been prepared to spend this money. Um, but I've heard loud and clear from many more people that ask for that money to be defeased that say that you're going to have a hell of a time passing a bond if you don't defease it back. Not many people, probably I can count on my hand, of the people that are in favor of spending the money have said that. We've got to also think that we're going to be running these projects and on top of, of what we're currently paying. And that's, that's going to increase the, the tax liability of those families. I don't understand what you said. Um, we, we keep the 19 million and we move forward with our, our um, long range facilities planning. Um, we're still going to be paying that bond off when we're running those the next levies, the next bonds. Yeah, our next, but our next levies would not be a capital levy. No, our next but levy would be a. Uh, but that's going to increase levy. people's tax liability. Yeah, and yeah. so they're so they're they're paying on the bond that we're using that money that we didn't defease back, and now they're going to be paying on on new levies. There's going to be new liabilities, which just increases that tax liability. Well, you send it back to them, the same people that you say that people say you give it back to us and then you ask for it again. Right. Well, if we keep it, we're still going to be asking for it. And now we're asking for more and we're asking for more and we're asking for more. Well, we're asking for more in two years. If we give it all back now, we're asking for it in four, four years if we don't. Okay. Can we? we're, we're almost out of time. Yeah, okay. I would like to say one more thing. You, we want to go ahead. I'll give you, I'll split well, the time just, with you. In my simple country mind, you know, why couldn't we run a capital levy and then consider defeasement? Hmm. And that order so instead of the other one, instead of defeasing and then running a capital levy. Why do we have to do it in that order? That's one way to find out what kind of support we've got. That's an interesting thought. Never considered that. Why, why would you run a capital levy if you've got nineteen million dollars in the bank? Then that's the. I think that's that what teams not going to go. go. That nineteen's not going to go because there's more items that keep getting added to that list, and so that nineteen million is going to get get spread pretty thin, and probably not hit everything on that list. And then we're going to have people that put things on that list that are going to be upset because they're needs their wants didn't get met 
We need to be specific on what we're asking for. Thank you all. Um, I just want to wrap up with the, the obviously as the community can hear, we're still kind of in limbo on this thing. And to me, it just simply points to the fact that we should take our time with this. And I know that you disagree with that. I think we need to do another forum with exact numbers or as close as we can get specific things so people know what we're talking about instead of doing this right now because it makes us feel good. We need to make sure that this is what people want. We talk about transparency. This is transparency. This is what it looks like when we keep bringing it out to the community. We keep sharing with them the, the bits and pieces of information. We keep hearing from different, for, uh, different members of the community sharing their thoughts with us. A couple of things that um, I, I, I have trouble with this, and I just wanted to clarify. So um, it, it seems to be implied that, you know, uh, if the money were used, that no one would ever vote for a bond or levy again. In my heart of heart, I don't believe that. I think every member of this community cares about their family, their kids, and other kids in the community, and will vote to make sure that those schools, uh, these schools continue and are successful. They're not just going to abandon it because they disagree with us. If you talk about trust in our community, I think everybody in this room is smart enough to figure out what they want. They know what they believe in. And that's the beauty of this process is giving them a chance to share what they believe in instead of us going to make a decision without the full input or as much input as we can gather. What's the harm? We can't do this anyway overnight. What's the harm of hearing a little bit more input before we make a final decision? We lose nothing. If anything, we gain the interest by it sitting a little bit longer, but that's not the reason I'm suggesting it. The reason I'm suggesting it is I want as many people to have a voice as we possibly can get. At the point that we've done as much as we can do, and that's the end of it, then we make a decision. But we've done it knowing that we've gotten as much input as we possibly can get. And then lastly, I want to say, and I know this is going to be unpopular, but I've always felt, since I've been on the board, athletics always gets kicked, to the can gets kicked down the road. We don't invest in the kids and their athletic abilities. Athle athletics develops leadership, discipline, um, tenacity, all those good things that we tend to overlook because we're looking in a book to get those skills instead of what other skills these kids have. We need to develop all kinds of skills that these kids have and are, are going to have in the future. There's a lot of ways they contribute to community. It's not always exactly what they get out of a book. They should continue their education. I'm not disputing that in any way. I'm just saying, here's another avenue. I don't want to see us keep ignoring it. And I think we've got an opportunity here, even if we don't use all of it, some of it. Maybe the solution is a compromise. I don't know. But all I'm saying is I want to hear more from the community before I make my decision on the vote. And that's enough for tonight. Let's, let's move on. At this point, I would ask Mr. Connolly if you could, as much as possible, gather some hardcore numbers for us for the next meeting. All right, let's take a good discussion, everybody. Thank you. You need to finish the agenda. Well, that was that was five. All right. I thank you. Items arising. Anybody? When does this come back for a discussion? Approximately. Well, we can continue. That's a good question. I, I just I all I'm asking for is, is I just want to know what the process is. That's all. I, that's all I want to know. Well, the process is at this point, as soon as Mr. Conley can get us some higher numbers to go with that, that's part of the next steps. Once we get that, we put it on the agenda. We come back and decide on when we're going to have the next meeting. My, my, my preference would be we get enough of those higher numbers. We go back to the community one last time to hear what they have to say. And then we come back with a plan for hearings, meetings, whatever it is we want to do to make a final decision. Sure, it's going to take a little bit more time, but I think it's well worth it at this point. Anybody disagree with that approach? No, I sure. thought the process was that we were going to have the community forums and then and then make a decision. I guess I guess not. Well, I, I, no. I guess the, the, the and I, I again, I hear what you're saying. I, get, I guess we can take as much time as 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 you want. I just want to know what the defined process is what we're going to do, we stick with that, and that's that's what we're going to well, do. Well, I just gave it to you. Um, we're waiting. We need those numbers. We need those numbers. I don't think we should proceed until we have some hardcore numbers or some, as good numbers as we can get on some of these estimates. We'd be shooting in the dark without it, I think. All right. Items arising. Anything from any of the other members? Then we'll adjourn the study session.
Um, we need to take a little five minute break and we start at 708 just so each of us can take a little break here. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening.
Hey, good evening, everyone. It is 7.08 p.m. We'll go ahead and get started with the regular board meeting. Um, we'll start again by doing the Pledge of Allegiance. Again, it's today is Tuesday, November 8th, 2022, 7.08 p.m. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, any changes to the agenda? Uh, no changes to the agenda. All right, communications? Uh, we did not have a need for response to public comment, so we'll go to item B, which was recognition by the Washington State School Directors Association for the West Valley School District Board of Directors as a 2022 Board of Distinction. So only 10% of school district uh, school boards across the state of Washington received this recognition in the 2022 school year and 2022 for Board of Distinction. So just congratulations to the school board. And um, as we, uh, I had in that letter to the editor today, uh, our board doesn't always agree and that's okay because they are a model of civil, civic engagement for our community. And um, just a, a great model of a functioning democracy in action. So I appreciate the work of all the board members and appreciate the ability to work together and keep uh, overall focus on what's best for our students in West Valley, what's best for the community, and having high expectations for the West Valley School District. So join me in congratulating our school board. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and do um, the school presentation. As we are at the school where that's gonna take place, the mid-level campus, so. All right, so we have uh, Principal Richard Pryor is here. Uh, he has students and staff. We're going to ask the board to go ahead and join the audience so we can see the uh, pr the PowerPoint presentation. And uh, we're going to turn this over to Principal Richard Pryor. So thank you, school board, and congratulations on the um, honor you got tonight. Um, our presentation tonight, I knew I wanted to do back in August before school got started. Um, uh, we, it's about advisory at the middle level uh, campus. Um, when I walked in here last year and post COVID and all the myriad challenges and, and things that we had, one of the things that um, we're talking about and working through was advisory. And, um, West Valley and had been done <clears throat> at the middle level campus had done an advisory one day a week for quite a while. Um, we got talked into doing two days a week last year and with mixed buy-in and results. Um, so last spring, um, I kind of had the challenge of now, and I, and I want to back up as a parent, my students went through the high school and the advisory program at the high school. And, um, I had, and no criticism of any anybody. A lot of folks had questions, um, even even now. And I cha I was challenged as a parent. What's our purpose? What are we trying to do here with the, with, with advisory? And so last spring, um, I, I I started looking at um, advisory different programs, um, and I do dove into secondary schedules, and I could not find a schedule that didn't have advisory every day at the secondary level. Um, and we took a um, trip uh, to Spokane Chase Middle School, and that was kind of the start. Um, uh, Mr. Clark, uh, uh, Mr. Snow and I got talking about advisory um, with the principal there and how they had their advisory structured. And so that got me thinking about it. And so I dove into it um, then and kind of really looked at it. And as a principal, you know, once in a while I get to actually make a decision. And the decision I made was we're gonna do advisory every day. Where I brought in staff was, look, there's a purpose for advisory. 
And we started sketching that out. I intentionally invited um, staff members who um, hated advisory, didn't like it, didn't want to do it. Okay, let's make, let's make this thing meaningful. Because usually the perp, when somebody disagrees with it, um, it's because um, they don't see a purpose. And so we wanted to build a purpose and put something together. And so we had several meetings last spring, early in the summer before school started. And um, with, with not all staff, but those who want it. I didn't shut it, shut it down to anybody who wanted to join. And so we um, put this together and um, uh, Robert Fawcett and Ruth Veselka, and, and Ruth would have been here tonight, but she um, isn't available, um, really kind of spearheaded putting this thing together. And um, so I'm pretty impressed with what they've done and the staff has contributed. We've got a communication feedback method. We've had um, representatives from each grade level to the advisory um, so that we continue to look at what's working, what's not working. Um, we ask students, how's it going? We ask staff, how's it going? And yeah, there's some folks out there who don't like it. Um, but overall, I think we've got something pretty strong to help um, students with goal setting, um, uh, kind of staying on top of their world. It becomes that SEL component that the state's requiring for us um, to, to a degree. And so we just really, um, this first year, very beginning, but I think we've got something that we can really build on. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Fawcett and Mrs. Williams, Tiffany Williams, our uh, activities director. She is here also in Ruth's place. Um, and so take it away. Thank you. And so I am one of those teachers that did not like advisory because I couldn't see a purpose for it. It didn't have vision. And in uh, the meetings that we had last uh, last spring with our with Mr. Pryor and the group, uh, Mr. Pryor gave us some real vision. And one of it really started with what is an eighth grade? What should an eighth grader look like when they leave our campus? When they go to the junior or to the high school, what should they be able to do? What should they be able? What skills and attributes should they have to help make them successful? And one of the, or as we looked at the different things, why people didn't like advisory, uh, we came up with uh, the schedule wasn't predictable. It changed. Every day we had a different calendar. Uh, every day we had a different bell schedule and it was really confusing for the students as well as the staff. So we wanted a predictable routine. And I like this quote, uh, structure is stress relieving. And I really, I really think that. Uh, so we wanted a consistent schedule. We wanted to follow a professionally, uh, uh, professionally prepared and uh, district approved curriculum. Something that we knew that we're not gonna get into the weeds. We're gonna do what, uh, what the district has approved. And we wanted to build student skills, habits, and knowledge. Uh, to help them get ready for that. We developed a mission statement, and that's in your handout. We won't take time to read it here, but we also developed a vision statement to help guide the committee's work as we went through this. Uh, that gave us uh, some objectives. The objectives were build a strong learning community, learn and practice study skills and habits that will help them succeed in their learning, meaning the students, uh, develop executive functioning skills, planning, organization, uh, attention, uh, abilities, uh, problem solving. And then we wanted to have a learning community or for all learning community members to have a growth mindset, uh, that we can, that we can get better. We can move forward as students and as staff, we can get better. We wanted students to see what excellence looks like and how to get there. We, uh, wanted to have a part of our, the component is digital citizenship. Uh, the, these our students have access to digital stuff all the time. We wanted to know, wanted them to develop some skills at being digital citizens, uh, and then social skills. After the pandemic, social skills are something that's really needed in our in our kids. Uh, we wanted them to to uh, have respect for adults, peers, all students, and our community. We told our staff, and again, this this uh, should have started out. This is a presentation that we did part of presentation that we did for our staff in the, uh, in the fall to introduce uh, this to them. We asked them, just do it. Whether you're on or you're off, just do it. Give it a, uh, be on board, stick to the plan, uh, and your students will know your commitment level because they really do. They'll walk out of your advisory and within three minutes, 
they will know exactly whether you're on or you're off because of what everybody else is talking about. Uh, so we started a basic schedule. On Mondays, we decided this is a basic month, but there are no basic months, by the way. Um, so on Mondays, we're going to do goal plannings. Uh, on Friday, we're going to do reflection. On uh, the first week of the month, we're going to do Zello. Uh, we'll talk about that. On the uh, second, third, and fourth weeks, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Wednesdays we're going to do Character Strong Lessons, our uh, SEL component. On Thursdays, we're going to focus on missing assignments, and we also have opportunities for student or for teachers to do a teacher choice lesson or to do something that uh, addresses the needs of their students that they have in their classroom. We wanted to start out with a, a daily entry task of organization. So the students come in, they organize their backpacks, they organize things to turn in, they clean out things that they don't need to be hauling around the rest of the day so that they're ready to, uh, for the rest of the school day and the beginning of the next day until we have advisory again. Uh, one of the things that we're, we start out with every Monday is goal planning. We're trying to teach our students to set SMART goals. And uh, we're a few weeks into it. And uh, when we started, we spent 23 minutes trying to build goals and it for that week, and it was really tough. Now we're down to about seven minutes. Will I say my students are perfect with uh, SMART goals? Not yet. We're working on it. But um, we, want to, uh, we want to teach them SMART goals. We want them to set long-term goals, goals that will take the entire school year, and then short-term goals that they can do in the week that helps build them to that long-term goal. And then our goals will be part of our student-led conferences that we'll be having next week. Uh, on, um, on Mondays, they'll set those goals. On Fridays, they'll reflect on their goals. How did they do that week? Did they meet their goals? Did they not make their goals? And if, if they didn't make their goals, what got in the way? How can they do a better job next week? And if they didn't meet their goals, it's not the end of the world. Let's pick up and go on next time. And then we want to consider habits and replacing bad habits with good habits. One of the habits that we're trying to focus on is charging your Chromebook every night. Your phone is charged. Let's have your Chromebook charged too. Uh, we want uh, to set goals in three areas, academic, school, personal, and social. We want our students to be well-rounded in West Valley, not, uh, not overboard on one area, but we want well-rounded students. Our character strong is our social-emotional learning, and this, uh, uh, these are lessons that can be taught over two class periods. They're designed to take about 30 minutes. Our period is about 23 minutes, but it really, takes, uh, it really fits really well into two 23-minute sessions. They have some games to start with at the beginning. My kids like to play the games both days. So we play some of the get to know you games and the team building games each day before we start the lesson. Then we have half lesson uh, each day, finish it up. Again, it's district approved curriculum and it's professionally developed and grade appropriate. Uh, that's something else we felt very strongly about. Sixth graders are very much different than eighth graders and seventh graders. And so we wanted something that was similar so the students had a shared experience, but we also wanted it to be grade appropriate. Um, if, if we tried to do the same thing in sixth grade and that they would be think was engaging, the eighth graders would be bored. So we wanted something that was grade appropriate. Our Zello is our uh, college and career readiness program. Uh, where it, in the past, we've just had the students do the computer lessons. This year, we're encouraging the teachers to do the lesson, to take two days to do the lesson, and then have the uh, students do the uh, online component to help integrate what they've learned in those lessons into their lives and kind of to uh, reinforce that. On Thursdays, again, is our flex day kind of uh, for the teachers. But we, we, uh, one of the things we ask our teachers to do is focus on um, uh, missing assignments and that kind of stuff so that we're, we're putting some attention to that. Also, uh, building directed things when we have safety issues, uh, anaphylaxis videos that we have to watch, uh, earthquake, earthquake training, that kind of stuff that we can do on, on Thursdays. And then a lesson bank, we're, we're trying to put a lesson bank together so that the teachers have something that we know is successful, but will take 15 minutes, they can pull out, they can spend three or four minutes getting ready for it, uh, reviewing it, teach it for 15 minutes and, and be part of that Thursday. Uh, some of the things that could happen on Thursday, uh, maybe a lesson on how to properly email teachers, uh, teaching concepts that the students are struggling with. Uh, maybe how to define the area of a uh, perimeter of a polygon 
even if you're a language arts teacher. But if our students are struggling with that, we can take 15 minutes or 20 minutes and work on that. Uh, teach a lesson on digital citizenship, uh, community building games, or maybe a service project to go out and clean up the play field. Um, one of the things that Mr. Pryor asked us to do is we want to have service as part of our model. Um, so Friday is reflection. Again, look at the goals. How did we do? But not just our goals, we want them to uh, look at uh, what pr obstacles prevented them from achieving their goals, and then how did they apply the learning that they had this week? Not just in Ram Strong or advisory, but how, how did they apply what they learned in all of their lessons this week uh, into, their, uh, into what they do? Again, flexibility needed to be part of what we do. Uh, so as we establish uh, routines and processes, more time is available. I mentioned to you our goal setting on Monday used to take 23 minutes. Now it takes about seven. I have a little more time. I can work with my students on Mondays and Fridays because they don't take quite as much time. And then teachers can also work with their teaching partners. Uh, if uh, one teacher wants to teach a lesson, it gives another teacher an opportunity to work with small groups or maybe individuals uh, while the lesson's going on so they can do that. Grades. Uh, are satisfactory or unsatisfactory. We're not pass-fail, we're satisfactory or unsatisfactory. We encourage them to use a one-point tracking thing, a system for things they want to keep track of, like reflections, uh, completing Zello lessons, or, uh, uh, yeah, Zello lessons, or, and then uh, at the very end, have a participation grade that kind of balances things out. We want this to be a positive experience for all of our students. Um, I asked some of our teachers how for impacts that they've had in advisory. And uh, Lindsay King, one of our resource room teachers, gave, uh, gave me this. She said uh, sh uh, she, uh, she has her students help facilitate the lesson. Character strong is pretty easy. If you can read a slide, you can facilitate it uh, after you get used to how it's kind of laid out. So she lets the students in her resource room be the facilitators. And a young man that was new to our district volunteered to facilitate one day. And this is her quote. She says, it made the student's entire day. During his IEP meeting a few days later, his teacher spoke about how empowered he felt to finally fit in and have a place within our school where he can feel valued. She goes on. His mom broke down in tears when she spoke about the impact it had on his entire view of school. He was finally excited to come to school prior to this it had been a struggle to get him out of bed every day, uh, let alone make it through a day, uh, an average day at school. And so uh, our students are experiencing some success. We're still working on it. We're still getting some of the kinks out. But so far, we're making some good progress. And so I'll turn the time over to Tiffany Williams to introduce you to a couple of students uh, so that they can tell you more about what's going on. So I'm Tiffany Williams, uh, the ASB advisor and leadership teacher here. And first of all, Robert, thank you so much for explaining that so well. Uh, he and Ruth Veselka have really spent a lot of time making sure that our staff had everything they needed for advisory going into this school year. And I, I know, and I speak on behalf of those teachers. There are several who are so um, thankful for the website that was created, the Google Classroom that was created, the the way things are um, so detailed with those resources for for our students that are really relevant. Um, Richard, besides the advisory every day, Richard, some the other component he wanted was student voice. He wanted to make sure that we were keeping a um, a pulse on our student body and on what, how they were feeling about school um, and specifically advisory, but also just in general, hallways, lunches, um, the fun parts. We're, we're bringing those things back. It's been a while with COVID trying to adjust and navigate um, and finally feeling like we're in a place where we can do those things again. So uh, advisory reps and student leaders and um, getting a chance to have discussions with our students. Bernie Snow has been a part of that with me, Richard and Amber, and um, it's been great, and Nick as well. So the two students I have with you are two of my student leaders, uh, Callie Sinez and Kayla Gill, and I talked with my 
class um, last week and this week and got a, a vibe from how, how is advisory going for each of you? Because they're all in different advisories. Um, and it's a different, it's a mixed bag for all of them. But the one thing that I, I know for sure is that the teachers that they have for advisory know that they have them for advisory and they are getting to know their students and they're using um, the components that uh, Robert shared as a talking point and a starting point with their kids. And so these two just had some, had, had a, have had a really positive experience and I asked them to come share a little bit about that. Hi, I'm Callie, and um, basically every day in advisory, so like we'll start off like it's been a really good experience for me because like I've gotten a lot closer with some of my friends, and the teacher, Mr. Hansen, he's actually been like a really big help because he keeps me on top of my grades, and he's just like I can talk to him. Like uh, <laughs> some teachers I can't talk to, but he's like really easily to talk to, and it's just like a fun experience because we can go from character strong to Zello to doing our homework and he'll just make sure that like if we need to get extra stuff done that he'll let us get that done. It's just really good experience. Hi, I'm Kayla and um, I would say like the same thing like I feel comfortable talking to my teacher about like everything and um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Um, we talk about like being kind and like making our school like a better place. Yeah. How did you guys, were you one of the top ones for the Spirit Week? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we've been doing a like a Spirit Week. We kept track of like through advisory. We wanted to build community. And one of that, one of those ways was to have like these little competitions through advisory. So we're looking out at, you know, the sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, but also within those advisories. And Gorenson and Hansen are pretty, um, not necessarily competitive, maybe a little, but they um, they definitely brought it and they were our, you know, top advisories for both eighth and seventh grade. But those, they fostered that kind of community spirit within their advisory. And so that was one of the things that we... Um, and are now currently doing with our veterans food drive as well. So, yeah. Does anybody have any questions for our students or for Robert or myself? How many, how many kids are in, in advisory? How many kids are in your classes? Um, mine, I'd say about like around 20 or so. We try to keep them around 20. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of nice because then you can like, it's a smaller group. And so you can learn a lot more and be a lot like, you can have better relationships, I guess. Does the teacher have time to get around to, when you're talking about homework, just when I was hearing homework and other one-on-one -on -one situations, does he have enough time to get around to everybody? Yeah, I'd say so. He, like, because some people, like, he'll make sure that we all, he'll ask us to open up our grades, and then if anyone is struggling, then he'll have, like, a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them and, like, see what he can do to help them. And then other people, they'll be on top of their grades, so he, like, he, like, congratulates them and then just, like, he doesn't really need to have that conversation, I guess. If you, you are having problems and with your grades, does your advisor sometimes go to a teacher? Um, I'd say no, not really. Like maybe if we need help, like because some great like some teachers will ask them to grade something and then they don't end up doing it. So he might end up talking to them to help us out, but not most of the time. It just depends on you going to that teacher. Yeah. I guess this would be more more of a question for Tiffany and Mr. Pryor. Is that how has this affected uh, Bernie's day? No. Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, it has, it has increased his workload. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I feel like I've had really good conversation. Bernie's really excited about advisory every day. He is. Um, incredibly invested in talking with, like when he has kids that he knows he sees, he knows to go to that advisor. And then he has contact with that advisor through that student. And um, it allows him, like he described advisory as this funnel that, you know, there's these 20 kids who are being funneled to one teacher and that they have then that kind of 
he knows that that advisor is really keeping tabs on that student that he's concerned about. So that's his go-to adult then when there is a need for, you know, to and not necessarily intervention, but a chance to connect or see what he can do for that kid. And same with Dion Hotel. Um, there has been some of our um, students who on our um, the McKinney Vento who are homeless or in greater need. So that advisor is then they're like, hey, what can we do for this kid? Can you talk, have a conversation? I'll have, you know, there's there's not just now one adult, but some of our students now have two adults that are invested in that student. So he's got a contact point where you can maintain their confidentiality, but yeah. still get a good picture of what their challenges are. Yeah. Thank you. Do you feel uh, you have enough time for the ramp strong? Would you like to see more of it, or is it just about right in terms of the amount of time you devote to it? Um, I'd say it's a good amount of time. Like, uh, if we had any more, I feel like it would be overwhelming to where we wouldn't have, like, any time to connect with people or talk to our advisor about our grades. Like, I feel like it's just the right amount of time to where we can get a good lesson in, but also have time for our missing assignments, or our homework. The, um, the time is, a, is, is an interesting uh, issue with advisory. Um, and this seemed like a nice balance. And looking at a lot of advisor, advisory schedules out there, there are some that might be 10 minutes, three days a week, and then they have one day that's an hour and then all over the place. We feel like that consistency here in getting going, we're just kind of laying the groundwork. Um, right now, we thought this was a pretty good schedule. And Nick here, a master schedulist, and um, it did seem to work. It, it kind of felt together that way. Are the advisory classes um, comprised of general ed and special ed children? Yeah, yeah. And, from um, from uh, DLC classrooms as well? well or? A couple of our DLC well, kids Well, I should are. say, DLC, okay. Yeah, yeah, I was going to back backtrack on that. Um, the one thing we did do, um, one of the things we, we made sure is that they're comprised of one grade level. Mm -hmm. And so if you've got a mixed class, um, basically off of second period, we kind of tied to the high school schedule because we have some high school teachers that come down uh, first of the day and the end of the day. So we're kind of forced in, into having it after second period. And so mostly the second period, and then kids are shuffled out to there to get the numbers numbers down. And so if you somebody has a like um, pre engineering, we'll have a split seventh eighth class, and then we'll div divvy them up so it's all eighth, all seventh for um, for advisor. If you have days where you're having emergency drills or assemblies, are you foregoing advisory on those days? I'm trying not to. Um, if it's going to be important, we feel like it's a critical piece. Um, then we'll will adjust. Um, an example at the beginning, first week of school, I did grade level assemblies um, and I took, and so we did an advisory for an hour um, those days. And I did like this eighth grade, one day, seventh grade, took that advisory time for a grade level assembly. And kind of set the, set the year on. And are they creating any kind of portfolio to take with them? We're, 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 we're kind of working on that. What do you yeah, Zello does it. We're also trying to build this portfolio of this, the students with their um, student-led conferences and things. We're trying to build that um, uh, data evidence um, for their year, so they present that to their to their parents and have some talk around. And then their Zello portfolio stays with them as they go into high school. Yeah. So we, we start Zello at sixth grade and continues on. High so that's part of the high school beyond planning as the graduation. Part. The, the other piece is if you get on the West Valley Middle Level Campus website, there's Soros Advisory, and that, that's a piece that Robert and Ruth put together, um, kind of like a web uh, website, yeah. and um, has a lot of information and uh, lessons and different things like that. Okay. And just another access for, uh, for uh, teachers to be able to get additional support. We, we wanted to put it purposely on that website so that our teachers could get to it very, very quickly, but if there's any question in the community about what we're doing, there it is. Um, our calendars are there, there's information on Character Strong and Zell is there, so that uh, we're being as transparent as we can. Are you getting any pushback still about taking minutes of classroom instruction oh, yeah. daily? And how are you handling that? Um, I'm, uh, 
uh, carefully. Um, <laughs> not, no, actually not, not, not even that. I, I, this is important. Where else are you going to get the SEL stuff? Where, where else are you going to get the um, ability for students to do reflection and different pieces like that? We've got to do Zello. Um, it's kind of a requirement. So where else are you going to do this? Where else are we going to find time to do some of these important pieces? And um, if that's important, we're doing it. And um, I'm, I'm kind of just sticking with that. Any other questions? All right, let's give our students a shout out. Okay, thank you for that information. It was very, uh, very enlightening. So thank you again to the students who showed the courage to get up there and speak in front of this group. So enjoyed it. All right, moving on to item seven, um, public comment on non-discussion agenda items. Again, this is a point where any member of the public can come up and speak and on any item that they pretty much choose. Just be aware the board is not going to respond at this point, but we were here to listen uh, and get your input. So with that, is there anybody who would, has a comment? Please step up to the mic. Sorry. Oh, there's a, I'm sorry. I didn't know that. Is he? Go ahead. Brian, is it okay? Oh, no, they didn't request anything. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, just a couple of things uh, reflecting on the prior discussion during the study session. Um, I know there's been a couple of conversations about holding back funds related to the two schools. Um, my question is, and I sent an email, maybe it was probably about when that first came up about, I don't know, four to eight weeks ago. Um, the amount that's selected, if you choose to go that way, what's that based upon? Do we have any data from other schools after schools have been built holding back a certain amount of money? Um, Joe's explained, I don't think anything's changed that all the warranties, I mean, that are out there, they're being taken care of. So if we're concerned about latent defects or something else, what is that based upon? And somebody threw out a million and a half per school where does that number come from? So I think we should think about that. And how long are you gonna hold it for? And after you hold that, what's purpose? Is it only gonna be for CapEx? I would, I would assume so. So I think you, if you're gonna go down that path, establish some memorandum of, this is why we're doing it. It's based upon this. It's gonna be for this tenor. And then, you know, Mark Strong made an interesting comment we talked about, hey, all of a sudden we have all this extra money from the two schools, but we never really thought about what to do with it. So if you're gonna keep money left over, set aside whatever that amount is, which I'm kind of concerned why we're even doing that, but if you do decide to do that, make sure you put a timeline on it, what's it for, and at the end of that term, what's gonna happen? Because guess what? You're gonna have this big debate <laughs> for a smaller amount of money. And I don't think it should be going towards school program or anything that it should be specifically for some sort of capex because that's again what the bond funds were for. Um, separate topic, just listening to your talk, you know, Mr. Thorne made an interesting comment. He says, you know, I'm probably going to end this vote about this excess money three to two. And I see all of you tortured by this whole thing. Some of you mentioned oh, I can't win and all that. And again, I go back to if you really want to have transparency. If you really want to know how the people feel, you can have all the community meetings in the world. If you really want to know, do a vote. Do a vote of the people. And Mr. Thorne made a good point. What would that look like? Well, you have received all this feedback and it goes into this bucket of defeats everything. It goes in this bucket, split up money. Okay, simplify it. Have two options. We'll defeat everything and you guys pick the number. You've gotten the feedback. 13 million, whatever the number is, split it up and definitely come up with a list of what that list is going to be. And because 
Joe could work his tail off to get all the estimates in the world. You don't really know where it's going to come in. So on that list, publicize it on the website before you have the vote and say, this is our priority order. It's going to be, we don't know if we're going to have all the money, but we're going to do it in this order so people can see what it might look like. And then you're going to have the transparency that you're going to have. People are going to see it. They're going to know how you can spend the money. And it's no different than, like Mr. Thorne suggested, coming up with a separate levy for $9 million, so forth. He made a very good point about it's got to be specific. So you guys can get tortured all you want. You're going to kill yourselves. You're not really going to know. And you know what? After that vote is done, you can sit there and say, this is how the people feel. And another comment that came up during your discussions about, oh, well, having a levy or a bond is super hard. We've had all these votes. You're darn right it is. Because you know what? The taxpayers expect it. And if you can't convince people to vote for any levy or a bond, it's because you haven't made a compelling case. Full stop. There's a lot of reasons. I'm tired of paying taxes. The state did a bunch of mandates. I suggested long ago to do a survey, get NPS scores from the community. Ask them how do they feel about schools. There's some great stuff going on. It's marketing the good work that our marketing person do. But you need to find out how the people feel. And you know how you know how they feel? It's because they do a vote. And when they do a vote, they're sending a message loud and clear. So if you really want to know, so you're not so tortured, do a vote. Option A, defeats it all. Option B, some sort of split. And then you get your answer. Full stop. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Marinacci, for your comments. Is there anyone else who would like to step up to the mic with comments? Right there. Hi, I'm Heather Harrison, and I have a junior and an eighth grader here. And um, first of all, I wanted to say I appreciate that when I have a question about a school policy and I email Dr. Finch, you always respond. I appreciate that. I may not always agree with the answers, but I appreciate the response. <laughs> the one thing that makes no sense to me this year, though, is Ram Strong class for juniors and seniors. I am told by Mr. McMurray, the principal, that as long as juniors and seniors complete their one day a week assignment in social emotional learning, they pass this class. And I'm not saying that the SEL is bad, but I just asked if my son could just work on homework in his core classes instead of SEL, because this is where most West Valley high school students are failing. I really did not expect to be told that if my son does not participate once a week, he receives a no pass for this class, especially since West Valley high school report card shows that only 35.7% of students meet math standards and 43.9 meet science standards. My son is doing what he is supposed to do the other four days a week in this class, but nothing else is counted in this class. So after finding out that juniors and seniors are only being held accountable for one day a week of work, I am concerned that this is going to be a safety issue and an attendance issue in the future, if not already. I'm sure if some students realize this, they will decide there's no need to come to this class the other four days of the week. Not knowing the whereabouts of these juniors and seniors is a safety concern. By only putting in a score for one day a week in this class, we are essentially giving these students a free pass to not come to class the other four days a week. All right. Thank you for your comments as well. Anyone else? So just a few uh, comments to add on to uh, the earlier discussion related to excess bond proceeds. The number I'm going to use is an estimate, right? It's not valid for anything, but a general thought perspective. Construction costs today are easily 30 or 40 or 50% higher than the projections that were part of the long range plan. So long range plan was basically a 2020 to 2021 document. And as we all know, construction costs are simply higher. So that means two things. You can look at it from the cost side and take an estimate and say, oh, this needs to be 30 or 40 or 50% higher. Or you can take a look at that $19 million of excess bonds and say, it's only going to buy half what we thought it could. 
Okay, so there's two perspectives you can take to consider that. The long range plan, uh, if, if you haven't had an opportunity to go back and look at it, it has a tremendous amount of detail. So again, this is the Teeter Crocker document from 2020, spring of 21, I believe. Um, and I just bring up the example of the high school athletic fields. There were three options considered by the Long Range Facility Committee for that. One was a simple cost to reconstruct the track and the track alone. Um, that was a $900,000 kind of number. There was a second, uh, and I believe that was essentially, again, kind of refurbishing what is there, not tearing down the track to existing subsoil in order to rebuild properly, effectively to, um, you might say, recreate the air from the previous construction project. The second option was to completely tear down the track, replace the field um, as it were. Um, that also then takes all of the the typical track related events like the triple jump, long jump, pole vault kinds of areas and would have picked those up and moved those behind the primary bleachers. So the intent is that you're maximizing the grass space or the infield space that is within the track. Allows better positioning of uh, the football field, a better space allocation for a, a soccer uh, pitch and whatnot. And again, at that point, that was about a 2.5 kind of number. The only number that gets up to that 7.3 that has been kind of floated around in the project list was the concept of picking the stadium up completely and moving it to a different site. And at that point, the concept had been to pick it up and move it towards 96th, uh, essentially replacing, I believe, what is the JV soccer field and or part of the primary soccer field in a fully new constructed stadium. And that was viewed as a possibility for a lot of reasons. Yes, it does a better job of providing access for all three sports, soccer, football, and track, and then also doing a better job of aligning it closer to the primary high school parking lot. So there were a lot of considerations that came into those kinds of options. Um, and again, you can go back and look at some of the detail that's within the long range planning a document. Ultimately, that is my concern is today we sit and we talk about the what ifs, and yet we haven't grounded ourselves in the work that's been done by others before. The long range facility document was a lot of work by a lot of members of the community and it's essentially been set on the shelf to collect dust. Rather than going back and continuing to build from that, rather than going back and asking on a six month or annual basis, how does this plan look relative to the changing of conditions? How does this plan need to be updated or improved? When do we need to come back for a major plan renewal? So as we look at any of the choices moving forward, be it with excess bond proceeds or as we continue to evaluate the next steps from a district-wide facilities planning perspective, we have to be grounded in documents that we've spent a lot of time and a lot of money developing. The, the board to differing degrees has all asked the questions of, well, we'd like to have hard numbers. We'd like to have some certainty. Again, Construction costs right now are very, very difficult to put on. I tried to get an electrician to do a very small project for me up in the Chelan area, and I was told that they might have some time in March. So the professionals that do the work are not readily available in, in, in much of our industry right now. Second point is the value, or the confidence you have in the budget that's been developed for any project, in some sense, comes back to the time and the money that you're willing to pay in order to get that bid or that budget prepared. So if we decided today that we wanted to redo all the carpets in this building, we could pick up the phone, we could call Great Floors under a KCDA contract, and we could say, what's it cost to replace the uh, 120,000 square feet of flooring in this building? And Great Floors, working in the industry on an everyday basis, is going to be able to provide us a reasonable number for what it would cost, perhaps in the next 60 or 90 days. When, however, we go to industry and we say, oh, we'd really like you to go build a stadium over there. The value, the quality of the number they produce is going to be based off the, the <clears throat> comprehensiveness of the design. Did we go through the what if questions? Did we ask what is the electrical capacity? Do we have to upgrade that? What is our stormwater capacity? Do we have to upgrade that? What are the physical constraints? What are the planning and permitting kinds of requirements that we have to do? All of those steps require an investment in order to develop and, and understand the, the, the box 
in which that design is being built in. So I tried to press Joe down on a number. He wouldn't give me a number. Um, but I think if you really want to develop good, solid numbers, the district is probably looking at a $100,000 investment in order to get that list of projects brought up to current or 90-day kinds of numbers. The district, the, the school board is, and, and again, Joe can go back and, 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 and get a true number, but I, I bring it to you to understand the numbers don't come out of thin air with accuracy that you need if you're going to make that kind of a decision. So the district is, is going to have to spend money on planning and money on design if that is the desire. Many years ago when we sat down and we took best, what we thought were best practice from, from Kennewick School District, they had a model that allowed them to design and prepare for projects before they were brought to the voters. They knew what their high school was going to look like before they walked out the door and asked for $100 million of support. West Valley School District's next major project is presumably some combination of modernizing the middle level campus or building an additional middle school someplace else in order to create two 750 student campus locations. The long range facility plan considers that. And that's something that I even had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Pryor about last week is the what ifs, the concepts. But the significant dollar values that we will likely need to ask the community for, for whatever that project look, looks like, is not the 70 to $90 million it was estimated a couple years ago, but it's 30 or 40 or 50% higher. And those costs are not less expensive tomorrow than they are today. So I absolutely appreciate um, that the board wanted to take a, a, a measured process to move forward before a decision was made. I will tell you that when I looked at the numbers from the success of the, the bidding timeframe and the climate that was there, I can tell you that I had an early text message where I estimated the excess to be $15 million, okay? Because contracts are written to benefit the owner. Contracts are written so that contractors perform. And if the contractor doesn't perform, there's an insurance policy there to protect the school district. So the school district understood from top to bottom that there were significant bond proceeds that did not need to be used. Last note, back to Mr. Marinacci's comments about uh, dollars put in the $1.5 million bucket per school. Our intent was to build the schools that the community needs, not to build schools and then have a pile of money left over to address the wants. Okay. I can sit here and be critical about the things that I think were missed in the planning and design and the rush to do that design. The fact that we do not have functional outdoor learning spaces at either one of those elementary schools. The process that we, we did not have an alternate to go and build full-size gymnasiums, even though at the end of the day, we, have, we had the proceeds left over in order to do that, okay? We can all be critical of that today, but just because I wanted a bigger gym or I wanted an outdoor learning space, perhaps didn't meet the educational need that was the responsibility of those bonds. So a few thoughts. Um, again, I appreciate the conversation the board has had. Um, I wish there was an easy answer. I do honestly uh, have concern that the climate in which we run the next bond or levy campaign needs to be waters that the district has worked to settle, not waters that the district's actions or the board's actions have um, have caused to be more turbulent than they should be. Thank you. All right. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Matthews. Um, anyone else like to step up to the podium and speak? All right. If there are no more public comments, again, those of you who did offer them, we thank you for your input. Moving on to the agenda here, we have a few action items, approval of minutes. Um, if anyone has looked at those or has any concerns about them, 
uh, share them now. If not, I'll take a motion that we approve the minutes from the October 25th board meeting. Can we do travel at the same time? Sure, unless someone has a comment or wants to pull anything out. I'm I think we have to do minutes and the travel request separately, uh, separate yeah. action items. Okay, I don't have a problem with doing them separate. I move to approve the minutes. Okay, we have a motion to approve the minutes. We'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, now we have the approval of the travel requests. Again, if someone has comments, I'll hear them. Otherwise, I'll take a motion. I move to approve the travel request. Thank you, Mr. Moko. We'll go ahead and vote on the travel request. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries for both of those items, 5-0. All right, moving on to number nine on the agenda, items arising. I just want to make sure everyone knows that we do have our Veteran Day Assembly tomorrow morning at the high school, and uh, all are invited. Uh, last year we had over 50 veterans that we honored, and so there'll be a breakfast and uh, assembly tomorrow morning. Thank you, Dr. Finch. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to item 10, superintendent's report. All right, it's just, uh, it's in writing, but just wanted to make sure the audience knew this was an update on all the work on equity and inclusion that we've done. We had a work group last year and vetted that with our staff and focus group of students at the high school and presented to the board last spring. So there's areas of professional development, human resources, safe schools, student engagement, family engagement, community engagement, and data analysis. And um, in terms of safe schools, we're continuing to work on the procedures for prohibition of harassment, intimidation, bullying, and we'll continue to do uh, work to refine that uh, procedures. And then for uh, community engagement, just wanna make sure everyone knows that I uh, really appreciate the work of Amy Forrest. We had a nice kickoff to the school year the day before school started, uh, all district celebration in the high school commons. And we're looking to do this again to bring the community together, all are invited. And this will be on the Friday when we get out of school for uh, winter break. We'll have uh, Friday, December 16th from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. after school. We have a winter wonderland theme. It'll be in the high school commons. There's also home basketball games for the boys and girls team against Sunnyside. And so this will be a, a fun opportunity to bring the entire West Valley community together for a fun celebration and uh, kind of kick off the winter break and have a winter wonderland. Appreciate Amy Forrest pulling all that together for us. All right. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> All right. All right. Item uh, 11, board reports, board development. Anyone? All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. I'll call the meeting in adjournment at 8.01 p.m. today. Thank you.